type of the animation and the title of talk is physics informed spatial temporative learning for emulating coupled dynamic systems uh, for fracture propagation. All right, thanks a lot. And uh, especially thanks for uh, organizing the, the virtual version of this uh, symposium on fairly short notice. Um, so I am Diane Oyen from Los Alamos. And uh, I'll, I'll talk about emulating coupled dynamical systems using a physics informed spatial temporal deep learning model. Um, most of this work was actually done by uh, graduate student interns, Anishi Mehta of uh, Georgia Tech and, and Corey Scott of uh, UC Irvine. In fact, Anishi <coughs> would have been uh, giving this talk if we had been meeting in person, but she wasn't able to do the virtual version. So I'll give the talk. And uh, if you have any very specific questions, you may want to reach out to Anishi. Uh, her uh, email address is on the title slide and uh, it's also on the, the last slide as well. Uh, my contact information is on here as well. So uh, I'll start off with the overview. You can uh, watch the, the video there, hopefully. Um, so emulating a couple dynamical system is, is the goal of this project. So there have been plenty of problems which we've been hearing about today, especially using machine learning for physical sciences that focus on uh, emulating a spatiotemporal process. Uh, in most of these cases, we have simulations which we could run but they're computationally expensive or they're limited in sort of the scale that we can uh, simulate. And so we're using machine learning to speed up this process and we call that emulation. Um, what's different about our problem compared to most of what we've seen being done already out there uh, in the, the field of research is that we have both a discrete value process, which you see on the left. This is uh, fractures propagating through a 2D material. So the damage are the, the white lines are little cracks in the material. And as uh, the material um, is under uh, stress, those cracks will propagate. Um, but uh, uh, but then we also have the continuous value process, which is the the stress itself. So these are they're linked processes, but because the data is in such a different form, it's hard for us to learn a single PDE to represent all of the data at the same time. So instead, we have a coupled system. So our physics-informed spatiotemporal deep learning model basically gives us this coupled dynamics emulation. We show that's fast and accurate, and uh, in our case, it's it's completely data driven. So what's the motivation? The uh, sort of big picture project. So this is a very applied talk compared to some of the um, talks that came right before mine. Um, is we're looking at um, failure of br brittle materials. So the micro cracks um, can be well microscopic, so they can be unseen, and uh, they cause a little like deformation in materials. You may not be able to see the damage in the material, but as these micro cracks coalesce, it suddenly um, creates a sudden failure, which can be difficult to predict. So this is an important problem where we have uh, codes here at LANL that um, can, can run at uh, very high fidelity. So the micro scale, um, we model cracks um, along the edges of finite elements. Um, and our codes can resolve individual cracks, the coalescence, the interactions among the cracks, but the mesh has to be highly resolved in order to capture the most interesting crack propagation uh, that happens, like forking and branching. Um, so, so between the, the finite elements, basically there are these cohesive points which we model as, as springs. You can see this on the right here. Um, the important uh, point to take away about the, the damage model on the springs is that although in the simulation it is a continuous value, damage you know, can, can basically go from zero to one um, if you want to think the maximum as one, there's a point which is not very much damage at all. It's usually around 0.1 that beyond that point, damage cannot be repaired. And so, uh, you know, it's a very highly peaked curve. And so for all intents and purposes, damage is actually a discrete value um, for, for our data analysis. So it's either not damaged or it's damaged beyond repair. Um, so our high fidelity simulations, they match experiment well. Um, but they are computationally expensive. And because that mesh has to be highly resolved, that means that's of limited use when you want to use it for predicting material failure at uh, um, for any sort of real uh, scale or problem that we care about. And so the workflow that we actually use um, to bridge scales is on the continuum model, we basically have these uh, individual cells where 
um, in order to get accurate results at the continuum model, then we need to be able to model the micro cracks um, within each cell. And so that's uh, the part that we're focusing on this talk is how do we uh, predict the, uh, the dynamics with it at the micro scale level so that we can feed into a continuum model. So the continuum model really needs are these summary statistics that come out of um, the, the uh, stress and damage uh, simulation. So our goal in this project is to emu emulate the simulation. So we are going to predict full stress and damage fields over time, even though what we uh, really care about for feeding into the continuum model are the summary statistics are extracted from uh, those stress and damage fields. So I'll talk about evaluating our results, both in terms of how well do we actually emulate the full process and how well do we reconstruct the summary statistics that we care about. So to be specific about what our data looks like, um, these uh, uh, microscale simulations, uh, as I mentioned, they are computationally expensive, expensive so 1,600 CPU hours. Um, we can think about that if you parallelize over 400 CPUs and they take four hours each to run. So we could um, get quite a bit more training data than, than we have, but uh, to do true uncertainty quantification, if we want to do many, many runs, thousands of runs to feed into our mesoscale model, then that, that really be, does become impractical. Uh, for the purpose of, uh, of seeing whether or not machine learning is even a reasonable approach to take for emulating this data, we worked with just uh, 41 training runs, um, reserved 10 of those runs for, test, for validation and 10 for testing. Um, so the data basically simulates material that's uh, two-dimensional material. Um, there are a number of cracks initialized into uh, the material. Um, so so it's to, the experiment so set up is basically at the bottom edge of the material is, is fixed, it's held in place while the top edge is being pulled at a constant velocity. So as that top edge is being pulled at that constant velocity, these uh, cracks will start to uh, get longer. Um, it, it is set up so that we don't really get new cracks appearing out of nowhere. That, that's very unlikely to happen. Um, from one run to the next, the locations and the orientations of these cracks varies. So that's the only thing that varies from one simulation to the next is the locations and orientations of the cracks, but they're always fairly well spread out among the sample, and there's always 20 to begin with. So the, the goal for machine learning is to learn the interactions between the stress and the damage fields in the material um, so that we can reduce the computational cost of running out, you know, many, many simulations. Uh, the quantities of interest that we care about, it looks like my damage video is not running here, so let me play. Oh, it is running. Okay. Um, that's something I'll mention. That the, um, yeah, the, uh, the damage actually spends a long time doing nothing at all, so you don't see anything happening to the damage right now while the stress wave begins to propagate as that material is being pulled from, from the top, um, and then I'll wait until it starts over again, and I'll walk you through it a second here. Uh, there we go. So a stress wave starts at the top as the material is being pulled. It, it, once it reaches the bottom, it reflects back, and that's when interesting things start to happen. That the discontinuities are introduced by the, the, the fractures um, cause very high concentrations of stress at very, at, uh, generally at the crack tips themselves. And when that happens, then the crack tips will start to propagate. And you see among the cracks here near the bottom, um, that, that's where the point of failure ends up happening in this sample, is that those cracks end up growing to, to such a length that they get all the way to the, each edge of the sample, whereas there are many cracks in the middle that do not uh, seem to grow at all. And so being able to predict uh, when and where these cracks will actually propagate is, is the difficult problem that we're trying to solve. So the quantities of interest that actually get fed into the uh, mesoscale model are the number of cracks at each time step. We start with 20, and then as they coalesce, that number can reduce down to 19, 18, 16, whatever. Um, the crack length distribution at each time step, so if very long cracks are developing, that is interesting. Um, at just knowing how many long cracks versus short cracks. Uh, and also the maximum stress at each time step. So that's really the only quantity of interest that's related to the stress that we actually want to learn is um, just, we don't need to know the entire stress field for the mesoscale model. All we need to know is the maximum stress uh, through the time series. Uh, 
Uh, and I'll mention this is a false color sort of uh, image of this dress where we combine the three different directions of stress using different colors. So some of the challenges for machine learning in this problem is that the damage events are extremely rare. So as you saw, only one to 3% of the, the pixels of the area that the damage field actually become damaged. The graph at the bottom shows us that if we actually, when we pixelate our, um, our simulation or to feed into machine learning algorithm, this shows what ratio of damage of the pixels are actually damaged. You know, so it starts with uh, just under 2% of the, of the pixels are damaged and to around 3% by the end of it. Um, and then this is our highest priority of, of the machine learning models to predict these damage events, yet there's really not enough information in the damage data alone to predict damage. So our solution to this is, is two parts. One, we amplify the information in the damage field, and I'll talk about that shortly. Um, the other thing is to actually predict uh, our stress because we know that stress predicts damage. Often when you want to do machine learning, it's better to just go straight for the thing you want to predict. If you want to predict damage, just predict damage and forget about the stress. But in this case, there's so much more rich information in the stress field. Um, so we actually model the stress so that we can predict the damage. I just have a quick well, question on, yeah. on this slide. Can, yeah, yeah, can you go back? Uh, so what do you mean? Uh, yeah, yeah, this one, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah I can hear you. Yeah, uh, so what do you mean there is not enough information in the damage data alone to predict damage? Uh, so a couple that. years ago we looked at um, uh, predicting uh, yeah the propagation of damage just based on you know knowing where the locations of the cracks are and we can do things like predict which cracks oh, will grow. Uh, we can predict we can even get a prediction of the time to failure based on the initial location of the cracks but knowing exactly when they start propagating and gain that, that full distribution of the crack length over time was, was very difficult. So, so basically we can predict which path will be the failure path with like 85% accuracy or so, um, but getting any higher than that, there, there wasn't really anywhere we could go. You know what I mean? There, there wasn't. Um, but you can also, uh, you can measure strain or stress or other quantities or? Right, right, right. so we're using stress now. Okay. That's what I'm saying. If, if all we want to predict was where the damage is, and sometimes just training the model at, with damages input, damages output would be the most direct way to do it. Right. Okay. Sure. Sure. Um, because our, our assumption is all we have is the beginning of time, right? You, you don't get to see where the stress is at time step 50 to make the prediction for damage 51. You, you only get to see the very beginning. Right. You get, we, we know where the, the, the cracks are, and now we want to predict what's going to happen as we un, unroll over time. And so making that prediction of what stress will do over time um, is difficult, uh, but, but I, I'm going to show that it's, it was necessary to be able to also predict the, what happens to the damage over time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Right. So the, the stress values, um, well, they are continuous. That's not really a challenge in of itself. That actually is good news. It's easy for us to deal with, except that the, the range of values is enormous. Um, so they, they can range as high as uh, 10 to the 8. Actually, we show them up to about, um, yeah, up, up to that high. So at the beginning of the simulation, you can see that the range of values, of the stress values, this is just a histogram here, can range all the way from 10 to the minus 6 to 10 to the six. And what's important to note is that the extremely high values of stress are important because that's where the damage occurs. So we don't want to just truncate off these high values. Um, we might be losing important information if we do that. At the same time, these very small values, um, the, the differences between 10 to the minus six and 10 to the minus five actually are significant. At the beginning of the simulation, when that stress wave is just trying to propagate, if we do something that flattens that those low values out too much, then uh, then, then we lose the the propagation of of uh, stress as it as it sort of you know as it evolves throughout the field. Um, so normalization is an issue is is, is what I'm I'm trying to say here. Um, we also have a problem with regression to the mean, um, which I, I think has been touched on earlier today. Um, is, you know, it, we, we really do need to capture these extreme values of stress when they are happening. And so if we are always predicting things are a little bit lower than what this true stress is, that was, this was really a problem that we were having um, before we came up with this specific architecture. 
uh, because if we keep under predicting the values of stress as we unroll over time, these, these errors are biased and they, uh, they compound each other. And eventually we're you know, predicting that nothing's happening and no damage is occurring. Um, so the solution to this was emphasizing the importance of relative magnitudes, um, basically by using the spatial and the temporal finite differences. So in other words, we're sharpening spatially and in time, so uh, to encourage uh, uh, large gradients uh, in the predictions. We call that physics informed, a physics informed loss function. So here's an overview of our machine learning approach. Um, so we include the spatial and temporal information, uh, local information, and global information. Uh, so uh, here in the little box, just you know, as a very high level overview. Um, basically, we're taking a few initial frames to, to, as a setup as uh, we assume that's all we get to see is the initial conditions. If all we had was the very first frame, then we would only have information about the locations of the damage and we wouldn't really have any information about the stress at all. Um, so in order to, in our simulations, all the stress is, I mean, all of the, the velocity that's being pulled at the initial stress there is the same anyway. Um, but to make this more of a general model where, you know, maybe that stress could be different, we, we think having the information about different, uh, you know, the first few frames. So we use k equals three, the first three frames gives us, lets us see some of that initial stress. Um, we feed it into um, our machine learning model, which is a combination of a, com a convolutional neural network and, um, and a long short term memory network. And I'll go into more details about those. And I'm assuming everybody's pretty familiar with the uh, CNNs and LSTMs in general. So the output is a single frame. So the input starts with three frames in time. The output is a single frame. And by frame, I mean the combination of the three directions of stress and the damage. Um, so, so we predict one frame in time. And then as we show on the bottom image here, um, we predict the, the, the next frame in time. So the blue frames are the predictions. That prediction feeds into the, the, uh, the next forward model, basically. So when we're making our predictions, we feed our predictions back into our forward model to make the next prediction. And as I mentioned, this is a particular problem if we are having biased errors that compound over time, then um, we, we need to have a very accurate model. And, and I'd say for the first year working on this project, we're able to get what looked like good errors for making that one frame at a time, but because they were biased um, and, and tended to under predict stress and damage that by the end or after several time steps, we were getting very uninteresting predictions. Um, we have a course in damage field, so I'll talk about how we do that. Um, and this is a fairly simple process, but it turned out to be highly effective and, and somewhat critical to actually um, accomplishing um, what we need to accomplish. So as I mentioned, the damage elements are extremely sparse to make up less than 4% of our damage data, um, even at the end of the simulation. So that means not only is it very unbalanced, which you know is is a, is a problem in deep learning. Although it's one that we you know there are ways to to make up for unbalanced data. The other problem is that the distance between the cracks is is actually quite large compared to the the, the width of the cracks, or even the length of the cracks themselves. So that's a little bit difficult to deal with with uh, fixed size convolutional filters. Um, so uh, so what what Anishi came up with was just a filtering process to to course in the damage field in a way that basically amplifies the size of the individual cracks. And now it kind of looks like a eight bit Atari game, but uh, um, it actually seems to work well for making those, uh, the cracks much larger than um, they would be otherwise. So, uh, so just to go over, this would be, we have several models that we compared and sort of the most uh, vanilla model is um, using a convolutional neural network to extract um, the spatial features, uh, and we feed the the, the latent space um, from the CNN encoder into a, a stacked LSTM, um, and then from the stacked LSTM, basically feed that into a CNN decoder. And so this is sort of the simplest model that we could come up with was to to capture both the the spatial and the temporal features of the data. And again, what feeds into the CNN encoder is three frames. Um, t equals one through k is three frames, and then when and then the output of the decoder is just one frame. 
that we're predicting. So modifications to that that we explored though, um, because there are, there are problems in the standard LSTM, which we've heard quite a bit about. Um, vanishing gradient is uh, one big problem and another is uh, learning the average values or the regression to the mean problem that I've already mentioned. So the convolutional LSTM basically adds a, a two-dimensional convolution, convolutional layer to preserve some of the spatial features. Um, but the, the more important uh, best model that uh, we found in the literature for this problem is a spatiotemporal LSTM, which has dual memories. And I'll talk those more in detail right here. Um, so this comes from um, a CVPR paper from a couple of years ago, uh, where they have both the uh, this uh, the standard temporal memory uh, C and a spatial state for their in the LSTM. And so, um, so it learns the short term dynamics better. And uh, on the right hand side, you see this, these are all the elements put together in our architecture. So basically, we use the, the ST LSTM. Uh, dual memory units. There are uh, both uh, spatial and temporal links between the layers and then there's also we also use the gradient highway units again to deal with the vanishing gradient problem that happens often in LSTMs. Um, the other piece that we added which I'll talk a little bit more about on the other slide is the physics informed piece which is in green are uh, we add these uh, partial derivatives as inputs to the learning algorithm, and it's also part of our loss function. So, um, so the the yeah, I'll talk about right here. So the um, the uh, it's not forwarding. Right. Okay. So the uh, the physics informed piece is uh, because we're emulating a second order PE. Uh, so we include first and second order partial spatial and temporal derivatives as part of the input. So instead of hoping that the, uh, that the model will learn, because it, I mean, technically it could calculate these in itself, but in case it doesn't, we hand it to it. And, uh, and then it has to predict these, uh, the partial derivatives as well. And it's included in part of the loss function. Um, I mean, it doesn't actually predict, well, it gets calculated from the prediction and that's included in the loss. So to be specific on the damage field, we use a cross entropy loss because this damage again is discrete. So C means that there's two different classes. And so basically we're penalizing whether it gets the, the correct class or not. Um, the stress field is one that's a little more interesting where, um, uh, you know, Anishi worked through several different loss functions. Um, the L1 loss we were hoping would help us to find the extreme values more accurately and not over penalizing, especially when we're looking for large stresses. We don't want to penalize for over predicting on the stress. Um, but it, it turned out that that was difficult to, to learn that um, I think it was difficult to get the learning to converge if you used a superior L1 loss. Um, so there's also an L2 loss included um, to smooth things a little bit better. But again, we're, we are concerned about over penalizing, especially on the large stresses. Um, and then the gradient difference loss is uh, basically the, the second part uh, here where we look at spatially um, whether the, the difference between neighboring uh, stresses, uh, uh, you know, the differences between the stresses of neighboring stresses. So we combine all three of those into a single loss and the, the, the values of those weights, um, I think it's something Anishi explored through cross-validation. We put those in uh, our, uh, our paper. So just to give a video so you can sort of see how well the whole model is doing the prediction, there's a lot to look at here. So I'll walk through a little bit by a little bit. Um, so the damage and the course inversion, the damage obviously is the black and white image. In this slide, the ground truth is on the right and the prediction is on the left. And I think in all of my other slides, I have it the other way around. So I apologize for that, but <laughs> um, I just noticed that today. Uh, so, so the, UCR predictions are uh, pretty accurate in terms of the damage. Um, if anything, I'll, I'll show it more quantitatively, but uh, sometimes we actually predict the damage happening earlier than it really does. Um, but in general, getting in the right places at close to the right time. Um, again, I'm showing the stress in the false color where the three different directions of stress are combined together and down below, I split out the three different directions of stress so that it's easier to, to actually see. Um, so you can see that 
overall, um, this is just a handful of steps in the middle of simulation, so that moves a little bit slower. Um, but you can see that our predictions are pretty close to ground truth, at least qualitatively. Quantitatively, we compare against all the, the various forms of the model that we tried. So, um, so our full model is basically the physics-informed uh, spatiotemporal LSTM against the simpler models. And so, um, and we have three different metrics that we judged them on. One is just a standard mean squared error. Uh, um, but uh, because in, in video, uh, they often use a structural similarity index. Uh, we included that as well, although I think in this case, that's probably not the best metric to look at because we actually care about absolute values in a way that the structural similarity tries to not care about absolute values. Um, and the quantities of interest is the other thing. Again, we just calculate the number of cracks and distribution of crack lengths and the max stress from our full damage and stress field predictions, and then see how well it compares against the ground truth for those. Uh, so, uh, bold shows which ones are actually performing the best. So, of course, our physics informed uh, spatial temporal LSTM performs best overall. If it's uh, every, every, so every single one of these models, there's a stacked LSTM, the convolutional LSTM, and then the ST LSTM model. So there's three basic models. And then if we include the partial derivatives as input and in the loss function, then we call that physics informed. So every model has a physics informed version and the un, uninformed version. Um, and one takeaway message from this is that the physics informed loss improves accuracy for all of the models. So including that as the input and as part of the loss actually improve performance across the board, um, ex except for the, the STLSTM, which, which performed about similarly. Um, if you look at just the SSIM metric, which again, I, I'm not sure is the best metric for, for this particular problem. Um, so another qualitative comparison on one, on one frame, just to sort of look at uh, what is it that we're gaining from the different models. So these are all the physics informed versions. So these are all the best predictions that we got from each type of uh, model that we had. Um, and this is just a still of one test frame out of, uh, out of the simulations that we had in our test set. So you can see the ground truth on the left. The stacked model, um, it definitely has a problem with regression to the mean and blurring of the image. I, I'd say that that's its biggest problem. The convolutional LSTM, uh, doesn't seem to be blurring, but somehow it's it's not learning locally, or or maybe I don't know. It's getting things locally, but not globally very well. Um, whereas our spatiotemporal model um, is overall uh, doing quite well. Uh, what I'll mention is you have to stare at these a long time to start to get to see what's what we're missing. Is that the the pinks here are not as bright as we would like them. So the stress is still being not getting it predicted quite as uh, extreme values as as we would like to see. Um, we'll look at that a little more quantitatively. So here's so another just a quick question one. Here. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, sorry, just a quick question. Yeah, the the stacked. I don't you remember which uh, uh, what you mean by stacked? Uh, stacked the LSTM. One. So I think it's just because there are three. I mean, four different channels. So they're stacked. The um, the uh, the three different directions of stress and the one of damage. Okay, so it's basically just an uh, it's just an I, LSTM honestly, without. What's that? It's an LSTM without the the convolutional network at the beginning and the end. Right. Okay. I, okay. I I believe so. <laughs> I think we'd have to check with uh, Anishi. Right. Okay. Okay, thanks, yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the, um, so this is the damage one. And uh, I, th I think to me what's interesting in looking at the, uh, the actual picture of the, the damage predictions. Um, so again, we, we definitely see that the only one that's really making the, the, the cracks that are propagated are mostly along the bottom edge. So the STLSTM is the one is the only one that's really getting all of the uh, the, the damage uh, values correct. Um, but what also is interesting to me, all of these are the physics informed ones, but the, the stacked LSTM and the convolutional LSTM are both getting some of these sort of like ghost predictions of, uh, you know, possible. I think these must be the, the probability of stress, not just the binarized version of it. 
they're coming out sort of in the middle of the areas where there, there clearly should be no new cracks forming. Um, the SDLCM has fewer of those basically happening. Um, I'm not sure I have an answer for that, but I found that interesting. So uh, just to talk about some of the weaknesses of, of our predictions still. So I, I wanna emphasize that overall, um, these results are actually uh, quite accurate. Um, and especially considering how they have to, you know, as we're unrolling over time, they have to be accurate enough to make the prediction on the next uh, frame. So we're pretty excited about these results, but, uh, but there are a few things that uh, um, we thought was interesting that we can still work on. Uh, one is this, that the, uh, that, uh, uh, that the damage predictions are, it's actually over predicting the damage. So maybe this is because of the balance problem. I'm, I'm not sure, or if it's just because of the coarsening, but you can see our predictions in blue are, they start the, they, we start to see damage happening at about the right time. So that's, that's one a huge win over our previous models um, is that we can actually see when the damage starts happening, but then we start sort of predicting that more damage is occurring than is actually happening. Um, and you can see on the right, it's showing the number of cracks. So again, we start with 20 cracks and then as they coalesce, we drop down to 19 and another one coalesces, we drop down to 18. So that's why it's a step function. Um, and obviously we're seeing, we're predicting that coalescences are happening sooner than they actually happen. But then in the end, the uh, time to failure is pretty close to being accurate. And I show, uh, this is just for one simulation, but, uh, but showing this is the predicted versus ground truth of crack length. So how long the, an individual crack is growing over time. And you can see that, uh, you know, along the line, we're getting fairly accurate, but we tend to over predict the length, uh, especially in the middle of the simulation. But by the end of the simulation, so the darker, the red circles, um, we tend to get it pretty close to correct. So another issue that we still have is is the stress prediction. So these are the three different directions of stress in the field over time. And we were asked to, um, well, we're predicting the entire stress field, but then the only quantity that actually goes into the mesoscale model is the maximum stress over that entire field. Um, and in the maximum positive stress, I should say even. Uh, so, so we're not trying to predict the maximum stress, we're just predicting all the stress and then we take the maximum of that. And it turns out that when we do that, that the maximum stress that we predict uh, is fairly consistently below the, the actual true uh, maximum stress value in that field. On the other hand, we're getting a lot of the wiggles uh, pretty good. So, so it's, it's both good and bad. It's impressive how well we follow the general pattern, but we can see that there's definitely a bias to, to our stress predictions being lower than they probably should be. Um, or I should say closer to the mean, because I'm sure if we looked at the negative values, then you know we're, we're closer to zero than we want to be. Um, so overall, it's remarkably good, but we can see that we have sort of a systematic bias going on. Um, and we've already worked on, uh, on improving this uh, piece because it is a quantity that goes into the next uh, piece of our workflow. So future steps. Um, the first one is uh, we talked about coarsening the damage data and how we did that just using a simple filter. Um, so of course, doing that using machine learning would probably be more fun, uh, might work better, I'm not sure. But uh, so using an auto encoder just to, to, uh, to roll it right into the, uh, the learning process would be one, uh, one way to avoid using a fixed filter. Um, we'd also like to be quantifying the uncertainty of our predictions rather than right now we're just showing, you know, here's our getting one prediction, but how do we, how do we actually uh, you know, feeding into our, our the next uh, piece of the workflow, uh, having a you know boundary conditions on likely values would actually be more useful. And then the final thing I had just mentioned on the previous slide is that learning the maximum stress uh, directly uh, to overcome our bias, basically, and we, we've already been working on that. So in conclusion, I want to reiterate that the quantities of interest are are really being well predicted, and they do feed into our mesoscale simulation model. Um, so, so this is becoming part of our workflow, and so that's that's a huge win for us. And um, but I guess more as a takeaway message for for this audience is that the it's you know as we put the pieces together of uh, the machine learning model, it, it became very complex. Um, but it seems like that was necessary 
to, to avoid predicting to the mean, that was one of the things that was, was our biggest stumbling block in the beginning, um, especially because we do unroll over time. And so, so that was an issue that we were having and, and the gradient highway units as well as, uh, well, that probably helped with the learning process mostly, but, uh, but, but I, I think that the, the spatiotemporal model itself really helped a lot and also the physics informed loss function. Um, we also have the issue of compensating for the extreme sparsity we have in the damage. Um, so that was another stumbling block for us early on was dealing with, uh, with how do we, you know, preserve the damage information that we have and sort of throw away all the extra extraneous sparsity that's unnecessary. Um, and the final thing is that in, in our case, we didn't use constraints. Uh, our physics information is just the, uh, the, the partial derivatives being fed into the uh, learning algorithm as input, but it seems like, so we're calling this a data-driven physics-informed loss function, and it seems like um, that actually helped every model that we compared. So I'll say thanks now, and if you have any questions, uh, and I thought it'd be nice to at least to include some, some faces here since <laughs> we don't get to meet each other face-to-face. -face. Um, and uh, so the picture is that would be, uh, the Los Alamos ski area in July. Thanks a lot. And if you have any questions, I'll take them now. <laughs>